So in our radical additions, we need uh, a little bit more stuff going on. So the very first thing that we're going to throw at it is that we're going to add uh, our peroxy species. The peroxy species can show up in a variety of forms, but the biggest piece that you need to be identifying is this OO. Okay, so that means we have some kind of R group connected on one side and some kind of R group connected on the other. And this is where you will get people typically referencing the presence of ROAR as a radical initiator. So if you see ROAR, you should be thinking radicals, and in particular, you should be thinking radical addition reactions. So ROAR with a little bit of heat, because that bond wants to break open, uh, will split homolytically and we now have our radical. So how does this work as far as our mechanism goes? Well, if we look at our reagents, we have HBr and we have our alkene. Okay? Before we push too far into this, let's go ahead and remove our ROAR and see what we think would happen. Okay? Well, the acid is the most reactive thing, so our electrons should come out, share with the hydrogen. We would form then a carbocation that carbocation would have our bromide come in then and attack and we would get sorry that makes it look like a radical we would get a radical addition or sorry a normal addition where we've added hydrogen and bromine across a pi bond so let's look at that we'll write that in our kind of left corner we'll call this a heterolytic heterolytic addition Okay, technically electrophilic. And we want to hold that information, okay? Um, because it's going to be relevant when we go through and do this. So our bromine went to the most substituted. And then our hydrogen, remember the rich got richer. Our hydrogen went to the least substituted position. Okay, so that was our standard heterolytic reaction. What happens if it now goes homolytic? Okay, well, we've got that radical. That radical is now the most reactive thing, so I need the radical to go through it and start this system off. This is one of the things that can become challenging, is now which do you react it with, HBr, or do you react it with the alkene? And it turns out that we're going to react it with the HBr. Why? Concentrations. I know those concentrations aren't specified, but the HBr is in there in a, a larger excess than the alkene. So we run our radical reaction. We're going to end up forming, and I guess we'll make it black as it becomes not useful anymore. We would have our carboxylic acid remainder, and then we would have a bromine radical. That bromine radical is now going to float around until it encounters something that it could react with. Well, what could it react with? Well, the next most likely thing for it to encounter would be more HBr. Okay, And just like we said with our bromine radical reactions for our radical substitutions, this doesn't result in anything particularly useful because we end up reforming HBr and now we also have another bromine radical. Okay. So while that propagation is happening, it just doesn't do anything exciting for us. So we're going to go ahead and ignore that as a possibility and just kind of pretend that we're going to wait for the bromine to encounter something useful. Well, useful would be our alkene. So now the question is, how does this work? Well, our radical is going to come in. We're going to have a single electron from our pi bond come out and react. But the real question is now, where did the remaining electron go? Okay. That remaining electron could have gone to the blue position. Okay. So if we drew that out as a single electron, we would end up with the bromine radical there. Okay. The bromine shared an electron with the carbon and so we would now have our bromine connected out here. Okay. Remember, we just paired two electrons. One of those electrons just happened to come from the pi bond. And so really what's happening, if we envision it, is that we're thinking about this pi bond splitting into two radicals. 
one of those radicals is reacting with the bromine, the other one just remains. Okay? So we've got the blue possibility, and then we also have the green possibility, where our radical now forms out here, and the bromine now gets placed in at the center position, okay, or at our blue position. Kind of makes sense? Before we continue to push and propagate these further on, which of these do we think is more likely to happen? Remember, bromine radicals drive the most stable products. The green one is a primary radical. The blue one is a secondary radical. Because the blue one is more stable, it is more likely to form. So much more likely to form that we don't expect to see any of the primary radical occur. Now, what's the next most likely thing for this radical to encounter? Well, it's, again, most likely to encounter HBr. And we're going to, again, see another radical reaction where we go through and we now form our final product, which is no longer a radical, and we would still have bromine radical now being generated from the HBr, which could now continue to go and propagate out the continue our reaction okay but the big thing we want to see now is the final product that we ended with when we ran the radical reaction all of those mechanistic steps we had to know differences about concentration stabilities all that fun stuff and look what happens at the end of this okay under our homolytic cleavage or our homolytic addition reaction the result was that bromine went to the least substituted and the hydrogen went to the most substituted. Okay. If we're following the rich got richer and the poor got poorer, the homolytic or the radical reaction is effectively the communism of chemistry. We're placing the hydrogens on the position that had the fewest hydrogens. Okay, so it's a redistribution of wealth, if you will. Okay, this homolytic addition causes a slightly different product to form. Okay, and this becomes one of the primary drivers for when looking at radical additions, is that we're seeing a shift in how those atoms are added across the pi bond. So you could fully expect to see this as an ACS. Do you understand the the heterolytic addition, our standard electrophilic addition that we talked about earlier in this unit, results in a different product than the homolytic addition. Okay? The way that I memorize it, because radicals just do bizarre stuff and they don't follow our same nice charge size electronegativity systems as cleanly, um, I memorize based or learn based off of the those rules and say where should charges fall Charges only work for heterolytic, okay? So I would look at my starting alkene and be like, well, I want the negative charge, whoops. I want the negative charge at the primary position and the positive charge at the secondary position. Damn, this is a radical reaction. Radicals do the opposite of what I want them to do, which means when I go through and apply my charges out, I want the positive and negative of my HBr to go same charges. Put the bromine at the negative, put the hydrogen at the positive. And ta-da, I now have my answer. Okay, the understanding of concentrations and all of those kind of subtle aspects that are happening behind the scenes for our uh, radical addition mechanism, I don't have to memorize. Okay, what I have to memorize is that this is radical. I need to know that roar so that I have my tip-off that I'm doing radical and I just run the opposite of how I would normally predict it to happen. Okay, That's my two cents. That's how I would go through and do it. You can decide however you want to go through and do it. Okay, With that, we're going to stepwise through some kind of prettier pictures of those, Okay, um, which I don't actually take all the way out. And as we addressed, that primary radical doesn't form, and we end up getting only the substitution happening at the or the bromine going in at the least substituted position. Okay, so that's our big lesson of our radical additions. Okay, so 
we now have two ways to react around an alkene. Okay, so this is a bit odd to, to reference it on this slide because it says radical additions. When we're using NBS, what we would expect would be the radical substitution. So this is a substitution, and I'm starting to write SN, which is a bad idea because SN means nucleophile. There's no nucleophile. Okay, we're getting a substitution. Okay, if we have HBr, there's that roar stepping out at us. We can now do a radical addition where we've now lost the pi bond, but we end up placing the bromine at the least substituted position. Okay, so we get two different reactions that we can do. Okay, the next slide is our birch reduction. Okay, so before you panic and go, oh my god, the birch reduction, this is just to show the mechanism behind it. Okay, so birch reduction is also a radical. You are welcome to look at this if you really want to. But this is there so that we can see that trans alignment. And we talked about that when we did the um, reduction of our alkyne to the trans alkene. It can officially also go through with benzenes and doing a reduction. That is not content for this semester. Not content for this semester. That is second semester content. Don't worry about it. Okay, that's the second semester. Okay. There are other things that can happen on that. So again, not content. Ah! Not content, not content. So don't stress about it. Okay. It's just showing that there are other things that factor into it. Okay. The last thing that we'll cover in this video uh, is potentially interesting. If we go through and just think about our reagents instead of just what products we would form. Okay. So for the very first one, we might go, well, dude, you just walk through this. Yes, fine. I'll let you accept this one as a radical addition. Bromine goes to the least substituted position. Okay, so we've seen that. But the very next one down, we haven't seen that before. Okay, all we're showing is Roar. Okay, so what's going to happen within this? So think about the reagents and focus on the chemistry that is available to it, not just saying, well, I memorized a result. Okay, so take an attempt Draw out some intermediate, see what you can come up with. All right, that means you should have paused. And if we're listening again, hopefully it's because it's an again, and you've drawn out some intermediates, and you're like, what the F? I don't know where I'm going. Okay, which is cool. So, whoops. So, Roar. Radical. In this case, we don't have HBr. The only thing we've got is the alkene. The alkene is definitely going to be the highest energy, higher energy electrons than even the carbon hydrogens so we're going to react with the alkene we want to form the most stable radical so we're going to go through and form the radical at the most substituted position okay and i'm actually going to flip the molecule a little bit and i'm going to show roar over here so roar comes in forms a bond to our structure which then comes out and we would now have the radical out there yeah you might be well like what do I do now? That's, that's still a radical. There isn't anything to react. Do I throw in another roar? Okay, does another roar radical come in? Okay, well, again, think about our concentrations. Remember, roar is a very, very low concentration. It is not likely to be present again. Okay, and you might freak out at this bond angle. You'll see why in a second. The next most likely thing to encounter would be another alkene. So what would happen is we would do another radical reaction. Okay, and then you're like, okay, cool. That's neat, Mike. I can appreciate that. We now go through. We now have a new connection. I guess we could go through and color code that. And that helps to explain why. Hey, look at that. That explains why I went through and I showed that blue bond and that horrible bond angle because what I was trying to set it up for was seeing the next connection. So I could go through and show that next piece, and damn, there's another radical. Well, what happens? Well, there's still more alkene. So couldn't it do it again? Yeah, good job. Excellent conclusion. I'm really a fan of that. And so what ends up happening is that this reaction will continue. How long will it continue? 
Well, it will continue until this reaction gets terminated. Okay, That termination may not happen for thousands of repeats. Okay, And if this was done properly for where this reaction was intended, it's probably going to be in the hundreds or thousands of repeats. Okay, And what we're talking about forming here is what is known as a polymer. Okay? And if we go through and look at this, we are repeating the same thing over and over and over again. Okay? So we could go through and we could simplify this structure. We have a lot of repeating units. So we have small units, which we'll call a mer. And if I have many of these things, I can call it a polymer. And there we go. We have the existence of polymers. Drawing out a polymer can become tricky because I don't want to have to show every single atom that's in this or every single repeating unit, particularly if this goes on for thousands of cycles. And what we can go through and do is show what I've got as the parenthetical. We can show the whoops. And it's, it's not a big whoops. Um, we can show whoops. God, that one's a big whoops. We can show the atoms that were necessary for the repeat. Okay. And so now what we're doing is we're control C. And then we would move to the next place, place and we would control V. Okay. And we just copy and paste either direction. So what we're including in that parenthetical is only the atoms that are necessary to kind of control copy and paste. Okay? If you notice where the parentheses are moving through, the parentheses are moving through the bonds that connect in. They do not go through atoms. They go through bonds. Okay? If I want to add a little bit more information, I could go through and say add an N or an M as a subscript to say that that's now repeating N times. So I could do that parenthetical and say 100. Okay. So what we're looking at here is what's known as a radical uh, polymer or a radical polymerization. Okay. It is typically going through and losing a pi bond. Note that we started with a pi bond and everywhere in our polymer backbone we've lost that pi bond. So it is oftentimes referred to as a radical addition polymer. Okay. So our radicals don't have to follow the same kind of patterns of simple just simple chemistry, we can run these things out and string them together into huge polymerization reactions. Okay, And that's kind of neat and cool, depending on if you know like that kind of stuff. Um, let's see, do I actually show that? I do. Okay, And we go through and we can show the polymer uh, polymerization. You'll note that in this version of it, I'm actually showing the polymerization happening the other direction. The directionality ultimately doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, as long as we're forming those uh, stable intermediates. Okay, so both are relying on the formation and stability of that pi bond. Uh, but now things can kind of spin around and move on us, okay, which is going to set us up for the next system of conjugated pi bonds. With our conjugated pi bonds, we had resonance that shifted electrons around. When we look at the radical reaction that we've shown below, okay, if we could have those pi bonds move, they could react with each other, even though we're only showing one. Okay, why does this become important? Well, what happens if we combine all of this into one giant glorious thing? We take conjugated pi bonds, and we take the ability for that molecule to move around in three-dimensional space. What could potentially happen? So let's simplify it a little bit. Let's go through and take these two pieces and we throw ROAR at it. Okay, well, ROAR in that radical, we're going to now allow for radicals to be forming here and here. We could then continue a polymer growth coming out from any of those positions. Okay, and we're going to get massively interconnected polymers. Okay, anywhere there's an alkene, we can get polymerization out both ends of it, technically, which I kind of screwed up. So we could polymerize out either end of all of these systems. Those chains don't have to be independent. I could have had this chain up with this. I could have another chain down here. Okay, And so as soon as I add in a structure of uh, 
an alkene, a, a conjugated alkene like this, those two pi systems uh, can interact or they could act as separate individuals, and we'd get what is known as a cross-linked polymer. Okay, so really pushing the bounds of our understanding of polymer chemistry. Um, but it, it's cool, and we get a lot more neat stuff. We get more rigid structures and things like that. We run a lab in second semester as a pseudo pitch to help get you to stay in second semester that looks at some of those interplays. Okay, so let's make it a whole nother can of worms more difficult, and let's get rid of the roar. Well, if there's no roar, there's no radical initiator, which means there's no reason for these things to react because both of those species are not good uh, nucleophiles. Okay, um, We don't have positives and negatives that really hold with any real weight behind those. Okay, So we wouldn't expect much to happen. And because we wouldn't expect much to happen, when something does happen, we associate someone's name with it. Okay, And what that does happen is is that we end up forming a six-membered ring with a remaining pi bond. Well, what happened is that we took that diene and we did a sigma bond rotation. That subtle rotation now aligned the molecule in such a way that the electrons could come out easily, which shuttles those electrons over there, which shuttled those electrons over there. This all happens in one fell swoop, and we end with the cyclo hexene. This reaction is known as a Diels-Alder reaction. Okay, they won the Nobel Prize for this. Okay, the chemistry behind this is one of probably the most complex, in my opinions, tons of stereochemical aspects behind this. It is a fascinating reaction. It is probably also the reason why I got a job at this institution, because this was the reaction they asked us to discuss. Okay, I think it's second semester, so I'm not going to really talk about it. I do have assignments pushed into Canvas. Um, you should go through and do those to the best of your ability. Officially, it is second semester content. Don't stress about it right now. Just kind of move through it and do it and be like, well, damn, that does look like crappiness. Um, or that does look awesome. I really want to study it more. Um, because there is some interesting stuff there that I think would be worth exploring and playing around with. Okay, And with that... We are done. I have no more lecture content to give you. Um, I, I hope you have uh, the best of luck trying to absorb this content. If you've got questions, send me emails. Talk to me in the WebEx meetings because that's what they're there for. Uh, and then I, I wish you the best of luck on our final, uh, however it takes form. And with that, good morning because that's when I'm recording.